Good morning, folks, wherever you are. I'm Xavier, I'm also known as Jason to some. Um, you're in Santa Cruz, California, with the sun shining lovely. And I'll give you a, a fast radio burst tutorial in the context of halo gas in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, I have targeted the slides and presumably the discussion at folks that will have heard of fast radio burst before, likely read a paper or two, watched a talk, not complete newbies and not experts either. If you are an expert, you're welcome to jump in and correct all the mistakes I make. Um, but that's the target audience, kind of folks that have some basic knowledge of FRBs, but not, not much working. And I'm going to have the discussion as we go. So I'm not going to present for 20 minutes and then open the floor. I'm just going to pause every slide or two or, and uh, we'll discuss. Um, we can do it by turning on your audio or we can do it by typing into Slack. I'll be monitoring the Slack channel. And last, I want to introduce Brian Gensler, who's, I believe, in the audience um, and is co-conspirator on FRBs in this workshop. Hello. And we'll uh, speak especially the last few slides, but we will also hopefully correct all the mistakes I make about radio astronomy, um, given that's not my background at all, and it sure surely is his. Okay, um, I put this a link to the slides on the channel and the tutorial channel and the FRB channel. And I've tried to make a fair number of the links clickable so that you can jump around if you come back to them. And that includes this GitHub uh, a repository, or actually it's an organization with multiple repositories for FRBs. Um, if you're new to the field, that's a place where you can get some analysis tools that may be helpful to you and data. No, I just, just keep going. All right, so let's see. I should. Uh, give credit, do credit to a team that I'm a part of called F to the Four, fast and fortunate for FRB follow up. So are the majority of the team members. I'm the goofy guy on the far right. Um, our main objectives are to follow up fast radio bursts. We do not detect them ourselves. We rely on radio telescopes and their collaboration to do so. Um, but we spend a fair bit of time with ground based telescopes and space at most wavelengths these days um, following up. If that interests you, we're welcome to have others join the crowd. FRBs, in my opinion, begin with the Lorimer burst. The, this is, oh yeah, I've put photos in, for those of you who don't know the field well, I've tried to make this a bit homey and put uh, some photos in of some people involved in this business. Uh, that's Duncan Lorimer, West Virginia University. He detected, I'd say by accident, the first fast radio burst, given that name there, 010724. That was detected in 2001, July 24th by the Parkes Telescope. The figure is a plot of the arrival time, that's the x-axis, of the pulse as a function of frequency, the y-axis, uh, often called a waterfall plot. And that delay, in the arrival of the lower frequency radiation is due to the fact that the pulse had to traverse through a plasma uh, of electrons that have retarded the speed arrival time of the uh, shorter frequencies more so than the higher frequencies. This is kind of 101 electromagnetism. Um, it leads to what we refer to as the dispersion measure. I won't go through all the equations here. They're not that exciting, um, but the um, <clears throat> Group velocity, sorry, the velocity of the uh, lower frequency radiation is slower, lower than the higher frequency, hence that sweep that you saw in the previous figure. And it's characterized, the uh, degree to which the light is retarded is characterized by this dispersion measure, dm, which is in the bottom equation down there, um, which if you're in the Milky Way, uh, in the rest frame, then it's the simple integral of the electron density along the path. Uh, there are more nuances to it than that. Uh, there's a nice write-up by Shriko Carney from last year. You can go check out to see all the ins and outs of that of dispersion measure. But in the context of halo gas, um, those nuances are uh, small enough not to be particularly interesting to us. Let me pause there. 
and if you have questions, feel free to type them into the tutorial chat window, whatever channel. Let's go. Okay, so dispersion measure, um, I like to call it a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's a blessing because you were sensitive to all of the electrons along the path line. That's something that techniques that many of us have employed absorption line, say with quasars, uh, it's not true for. With quasar spectroscopy, we're usually typically we're typically sensitive to one uh, phase, as we tend to call it, of density and temperature. Um, with dispersion measure, you're sensitive to all the electrons. Uh, formally, when you go to an expanding universe, you have to introduce the scale factor, as you see here. But it's also a curse in that you are sensitive to all the electrons. And if your scientific interests are in an isolated portion of the universe, as they often are, then you have to contend with the fact that the observed dispersion measure includes all the other components too. And so I'm cartooning the, the major ones here, including the length scales of the universe that go with them. Um, I'll walk through a handful of these in the next few slides, but the green area is gas associated with our Milky Way, the warm ionized medium predominantly. Most I suspect other people listening believe there's a payload of the Milky Way of baryons, and many of us are interested in characterizing that better than we have thus far. Those will contribute to the DM. The Milky Way's local group may contribute as well. Um, then there's the what I will refer to as the cosmic web. That's both the intergalactic medium, so diffuse gas between galaxies, and halo gas, the gas around galaxies, CGM. Um, Cosmic Web includes them both. And then there will be electrons in the local environment of whatever it is that generates FRBs. And I'm not going to speculate or discuss at all today what the origin of FRBs are. Um, but they undoubtedly will. We know that we now know for sure they occur within galaxies. And there will be local contributions as well, which we'll call the host contribution. Questions so far? So uh, the green from the previous is the green here. It's the uh, dispersion measure from the ISM, or formally I would call it the warm ionized medium predominantly. We have a well, we have more than one now, um, well-constrained data-driven model of that distribution. Um, Ryan, amongst others, has retired on measuring the dispersion measure to pulsars and measuring the distances, absolute distances, to those pulsars to map out. Um, the electrons in our galaxy. Uh, Joe Lazio picture here as well, um, part of that effort. And uh, we have now this, what I tend to use this NE2001 model for the distribution of electrons in, in the Milky Way. And as projected down the sky, this is the dispersion measure from those electrons. If you go through the plane of the disk of the galaxy, you can incur a very large dispersion measure, even many hundreds, even thousands. But as soon as you get off the plane, say it's 30 degrees or so, you can see um, you're down to the tens of DM units, it's parsecs per cubic centimeter, um, which is not negligible, but small uh, compared to fast radio burst dispersion measures. So we take that as a given. Uh, there aren't, I'd say the uncertainties off, off the plane where you're in the tens is, I don't know, say 10%, is that fair, 20%? So a few DM units, maybe five, maybe 10 even. Um, but this tends to be a small contribution to the error budget if you're interested in DM scientifically. Actually, I'll, Brian, you can enhance that kindly. Kindly enhance what I just said about DMISM if you wish. About DM what, sorry? About the... Uh, Estimates of the dispersion measure from the warm ionized medium, if I didn't speak it well enough. Uh, I, I think that, that the situation is not great. Um, I, I think the important thing about models like any 2001 is that they're um, a statement about what is known about the warm ionized medium in front of the pulsars that you have. So although 
by taking the equations that have arrived and making a map like this, it seems to have predictive power. Um, the predictions of these models have never worked out that well. And that, as, as the name suggests, this, this used all pulsars known through to 2001, but many pulsars that have been discovered subsequently uh, did not fit very well into this model. So it's a great way of characterizing or visualizing the data you have. The predictive power is, is limited, particularly off the plane, because pulsar surveys have spent very little time looking for pulsars off the plane, just because it's hard work and you don't find many pulsars and the ones you do find are quite boring. So uh, the information a model like this gives off the plane, which is perhaps the interest for this uh, workshop, is pretty limited and has not done well in making forward predictions. So the situation is not great. And what error bar would you put on there? Five units, 10 units, 20 units for off the plane? Oh my goodness. Sometimes it can be a factor of two, out by a factor of two, depending on the site line. Cool. Thank you. For the Milky Way halo, um, there have been the less discussion throughout the workshop. There's a whole channel devoted to it. Check it out. Um, we, myself and Yang Zhang, published a model based on some fair bit of the data known for the Milky Way and models of um, how halo gas may be distributed in dark matter halos. That's what this blue diagram is. And it also includes contributions, estimated guest contributions from M31 and the Magellanic Clouds, but uh, presumed to be basically an isotropic distribution of halo gas. And we estimated the dispersion measure here to be about 50 to 80 units. Um, this is not well constrained. Uh, a subsequent paper by Keating and Penn argues based on effectively the same data that the uh, dispersion measure of the Milky Way Hill may be less than 10 parsecs. Uh, plots at all, um, which I was part of, have used existing FRB dispersion measures and assumptions about the PDF of the external contribution to set a lower limit with a big error bar on that contribution, 63 plus or minus 25. And then there was a recent publication um, by Das et al, uh, kind of also using the 07, which again gives a range somewhat similar to what our model had uh, a couple years back. Anyways, this is a big unknown. I think this is an area where FRBs will uh, greatly improve the situation with analyses like what is in plots at all, but more sophisticated ones as well. Um, one can look for variations across the sky, and I know uh, Brian and his colleagues are hard at work uh, using the chime data to do that. Questions on the Milky Way? A sky crowd, or a, uh, is everyone still in Trident's channel? Um, I had a question. Shouldn't Please. the dispersion measure towards the Fermi bubbles be higher? I mean, we'd expect that they have an excess of electron density. Well, we calculated that wrong one. It was, it was a couple units. Yeah, that was very far away. I mean, especially towards the galactic center. Should it have higher contribution? Ah, I'm not including at all the interstellar medium. Gotcha. Uh, X? This is intended to be halo beyond with gas beyond 10 kiloparts per second of, of the disk. Yes, please. Yes, uh, so recently, uh, Hello say, Halo said the satellite uh, kind of imaged the electron density and they found that it follows more like two model, uh, I think. Uh, one is circular and the other one is sort of disk like. But I mm. know that yours and many other models, I think except Yamasaki, all of them assume a spherical. Uh, density kind of distribution. So That's right. I'd say the data allowed lots of different distributions. So continue to make models that you like, but um, going forward, I think that will be well constrained by um, large uh, survey, FRB surveys like Chime. And second thing is, especially mm -hmm. all these, uh, all the other models, yours and yours and all that, 
they kind of assume a NFW profile. So what about like the model that Veli proposed means isentropic, maximal isentropic distribution, where at till certain radius, instead of isothermal distribution, he assumed maximum entropy. How can we constrain that model? I don't feel expert enough to speak about Whaley's model, but maybe someone else in the channel would. Sorry. No, can... thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I had a like a trivial question, perhaps. Please. Uh, in the previous slide, what is this uh, excess at 270 degrees? Yeah. I get cast that from time to time. I'm, I'm pretty confident one of them is a supernova remnant. And the other might be an H2 region, but Ryan helped me out. <laughs> I always get this yes, wrong. One is the gum nebula, which is a very large, extremely nearby old shell, probably a supernova remnant. And then the smaller one inside it is the Vela um, supernova remnant, which is, is still quite large. It's eight degrees across, but somewhat more distant. So two unrelated shells that occupy a large area on the sky. Uh -huh. And why, why is the DM so high? You know, this is an integral of any DL. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a supernova remnant, there are so many of them, and it's an integrated quantity. Why, why is DM so high? So it's high for all H2 regions and supernova remnants. Um, uh, it's just that those two are, are, are large enough that, you, that the sparse sampling of pulsars that we have can detect it. But if you're asking like, what physically any supernova remnant or H2 region is high, just that uh, um, there's a lot of gas uh, compressed no, into a very... It's, Taking a 3D volume and converting it to a 2D shell, and so that greatly increases the, um, the DM associated with that volume. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so these are at a, you know, they are at a higher latitudes. Perhaps they are. That's why they are prominent. Well, they're close. That's another key point here. There's a H2 agent throughout this figure, but most of them are far away and hence small as observed. But they all have large value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Can you give us like the order of magnitude number of how many pulsar observations go into that? Into 2001, I'm going to guess 200. Okay. Like Ryan, no better than me. You have to have a pulsar and you have to have an independent distance for it. And getting the independent distance to pulsars is very difficult. There's only a few ways you can do it. And as the pulsars get more distant, most of those methods don't work. So, yeah, I think off the top of my head, uh, at the, at, at a 200 would be a pretty hard upper limit. It might be less than that. It's not many. Many many more pulsars are known and have dispersion measures and positions, but we don't know their distances. By the way, just as an aside, that includes the one so-called in the large Magellanic clouds. Those distances are not known factually, or I should say absolutely. They're expected, given their location, to be associated with the clouds. But of course, they're not truly measured. I have two questions. Please. Uh, one is Joe now here. Uh, one is uh, if I look at an H alpha map of the galaxy, it looks quite a bit different than the um, than than um, the last slide that you showed. Part of that is that the H alpha map is technically density squared integrated right. along one site, right. whereas your map is density integrated along one site. But I guess I'm just wondering if you thought about why it looks so different. I posted it. I think Brian spent three pages of his paper on that topic, so I'll, I'll defer to him. Yeah, so there's a few reasons. One is one is pumping uh, uh, in the emission measure traces n squared. The, the other is, um, is of course, the emission measure um, uh, from H alpha is suffers from dust extinction. So you're, you're losing most of the DC offset, um, and so the fluctuations look much more enhanced. You're just seeing a lot of local structure where with the pulsars, there's no extinction. Um, and um, uh, as X alluded, the, the N and N squared actually have different scale heights, um, so they they look they look different for that reason as well. Um, yeah, but the main the main reason is is that, that is that the emission measure is clumpy and suffers from extinction. But it's the same gas. Well, some people argue that there are, you're seeing different phases in the DM and the E, but the the mainstream view is is that um, is that the that it's the same gas? It's just that because it goes in squared, EM is totally dominated by uh, dense H2 regions that contribute very little to the dispersion measure because their their um, their depth is not that large. 
And my second question was, can you actually detect uh, or measure uh, DMs from pulsars in Andromeda that would allow one to test <laughs> them on the next slide? We all want them. <laughs> I, Lots of people looking at pulsars in Andromeda and no one's found one yet. Time's working hard on it, and so is the FAST telescope in China. And what about in the LMC, I guess, or the SMC? I mean, their pulsars are known, right? So, Well, is... as I was saying, their are pulsars known to lie in that direction with DMs that suggest they're not in the Milky Way, but the distances aren't. You know. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'd make a stronger statement than that, but there are some other pulsars are known to be associated with the LMC and SMC. Some of them are inside uh, Magellanic supernova remnants. I, th I think the problem there is that the SMC and the LMC both have a significant internal range of, of dispersion measure. So all you can really do from those is take the collection of pulsars that are in each of those galaxies and take the lowest EM and say that that's an upper limit on the foreground contribution. But, but there's if, if you look at the range of, of um, PMs in those galaxies, it's quite large. The mm. other really useful probe are globular clusters. There are many globular clusters that have pulsars in them. Uh, in all cases, the dispersion measure of every pulsar in a given cluster is basically the same. Uh, and if, if that cluster is far enough above the plane, then you have a very clean line of sight um, of the dispersion measure through the halo, at least out to the distance of that cluster. Thanks. Are there targeted? Uh, Educate me, Brian. Are there tar targeted surveys of global clusters still ongoing for pulsars? Um, I, uh, that's that's not really my my area. My understanding is, is that there's not a lot of work going on. Um, it's it's tough work. You have to spend huge numbers of hours pounding away at these things, and um, the pulsars are very faint. So I think all of the low hanging fruit has been done. Uh, but there are some other clusters that probably haven't had time invested on them, and surveys like Chime will hopefully start to pick these up as we see the whole sky every day and just integrate deeper and deeper. Nice. Cool. Thank you. Um, the cosmic web contributes as well. This is what I'd say sucked me into this field. Um, the integral here gives the average contribution um, based on the average density of the universe and cosmology. It does include one um, factor of the Hubble's parameter each knot, and otherwise it's just uh, baryon density, which we've known and loved and measured well for a couple of decades now, and the fraction of gas that's in baryons that are in a diffuse ionized state, which is the majority, but not, but not all. On that topic, um, I guess it's last year now, uh, we published the first um, set of data uh, comparing the, an estimate of the cosmic dispersion measure, previous slide, against the redshift of the FRB based on its uh, association to a galaxy. And the redshift comes from the galaxy, not the FRB. This is the data set, the colored, I won't go into great detail, the colored are, are um, kind of gold standard, the ones that met all of our criteria for the analysis, and uh, this is now uh, referred to as the McCor relation. Uh, J.P. McCor is the gentleman in the middle. Uh, on the left is Nissim Kenakar that some of you may know. Um, about a week after the publication, J.P. passed away unexpectedly. Very sad. Um, we miss him. Um, but he did see through what was, I'd say, one of the main driving factors of his uh, interest in FRBs, probably the main, uh, to this publication. The Data lie, I think you'll agree, quite closely to that black line. That black line is that integral, so the average DM cosmic, based on what we know from, say, the Planck cosmological parameters and good estimations for the amount of gas in the diffuse state. And the correspondence between the two uh, allows us to assert that we've detected all the so-called missing baryons that many of us have been concerned about over the past few decades. Pause there. Continue on. Um, for halo gas, uh, there's still plenty of work to be done. 
The left two panels show some model predictions for the dispersion measure if you penetrate a halo at some impact parameter, our perp. And there's just three different halos depicted there. It's three different masses. The y-axis is the log scale, the x-axis is linear. Um, you can see you get orders of magnitude variation depending on the mass of the halo you intersect, uh, the distance from the center of the halo, uh, not shown in this cartoon are the variations you will have for different assumed density profiles, which we don't know. Um, also not cartooned here is the variation you'll get from the amount of gas you predict have been expelled from the halo. This, these curves assume none uh, has been expelled, but that's some of order 20% are in and it's stars and neutral gas, so 80% in the hot phase, like diffuse phase. The lower panel, maybe I won't go into much depth, is describing the differences you get if you, uh, well, if you vary the, the size of a halo. I mean, we've arbitrarily, one, one, is, one has to arbitrarily effectively choose the size of a dark matter halo. Is it a real radius? Is it twice the real radius, three times. That's what's being cartooned. On the right um, is a conversion of estimates of the surface density, column density of ionized gas through L-star halos from the cost halo survey, taken from Jess Work's paper. Um, the blue is the cool component, as we call it. The red is a lower limit to the hot component based on 06, so lower limit. And the green is another model assumed uh, for an L star galaxy with a uh, assumed density profile. I can give you the details. Um, but the point is uh, for galaxies that retain a significant fraction of their gas, L star galaxies that have retained a significant fraction of their baryons, you expect DMs of order uh, many tens to even hundred uh, as you go through even out to about a real radius. This is pseudo theory, the, the, the blue histograms data and the blue line, I guess, an estimate of the data too. The green theory. Questions on that? This will give you a, a flavor of what kind of signal one expects from intersecting a single uh, dark matter hill. Mm, X? Uh, yeah. Mm. I have a naive question here. So, do we expect the density to follow a uh, same isothermal kind of profile after second turnaround radius means after at radius greater than two times the virial radius? That's a great question that I don't have an answer to, but I bet someone on the channel does or on the call does. Uh, what's plotted here is just a, an NFW, what is plotted here? Is the modified NFW profile that we've adopted. Uh, at those large radii, it's basically NFW. So that one of our cubes. But the question is, is that a fair profile out at two and three viral radii? Yeah, thank you. Anybody know? Anybody have an opinion, I should say? I don't have an opinion. I have a question. Uh, <laughs> this is Frank Vandenbosch. Um, <clears throat> when you have a data like this that is shown with the, with the blue histogram, how, how do you link it to a halo and, and this disentangle it from from the, the the rest of the line of sight. Yeah, so you should vi visualize sort of well. What's been done here is take the uh, analysis of the cost halo sample, which is order thirty sight lines, bin them up. What? Maybe twelve bins there. Not sure of, of order that. So maybe a couple sight lines contributing to each bin and then uh, generate a PDF of the column density based on the uncertainties, which are large. It's a log plot and those are large uncertainties um, to make the 2D histogram. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. Other questions? Cool. Um, I'm convinced we'll have a very nice description of M31 halo in the next couple of years. And by we, uh, I'm looking towards Brian and the Chime team. Uh, that's the signal that M31, that a model based on our estimates of M31's halo mass 
the assumption that it's retained most of its baryons and an assumed density profile. That's the signal from M31. So many tens even well beyond 100 DM units. And with enough FRBs covering both it and the random sky, you don't even need to know the redshifts of the FRBs, the differential experiment. Um, here we had estimated uh, several thousand would be sufficient to several thousand across the sky, not across the northern sky, not just several thousand and 31 would be sufficient to get a signal. So I'm optimistic Chime will have um, first results in M31 in the next couple of years. And I'm now more optimistic that the LMC is in play. So Andy Fox, if he's on the line, he and his colleagues published a, a new result on the nebula, see, yeah, the nebula of LMC, of the LMC. And between when I made this figure and now, I guess the LMC's mass has increased by a factor of 10 or a factor of something big. So the signal's only gotten stronger. In fact, I think it's stronger than the M31, if that mass estimate's correct. But it's in the Southern Hemisphere and not covered by CHIME, which is the only big survey by number uh, at the moment. So probably that's gonna wait till the SKA. But I predict the LMC will also be well mapped um, whenever the SKA is up and running. Comments on that? How about the cosmic web? So I'm asserting the barons have been detected. I'm not asserting they've been found. And so we've pivoted, if you will, to that question, where are the baryons? To what extent are they? Really the question's coming down to what extent have halos retained the baryons? They're either, there's a fraction of gas around galaxies in the CGM and the rest of it, I think we all believe is in the, in the intergalactic medium. And so what's the balance between the two? This paper by Sunil Simha uh, adopted this, the slime mold technique of Joe Burchett to make uh, a model of the gas in the cosmic web along that sight line using Sloan galaxies in our own data and make some comparisons if you're interested, check that out. There's work underway by KG Lee and his team at IPMU to uh, do say similar analyses, probably for sure better. Ah. Um, these are predictions, if you will, of what a survey of over 30 FRBs, survey will be called Flim Flam, it's ongoing, um, using the AAT to do, to do wide, uh, spectroscopy, which is required for the cosmic web reconstruction, as well as narrow, deeper data uh, to identify halos close to the sight line. And uh, this is a three parameter model that would show the constraints you would have on the host DM, um, the extent of the halo, RMAX there, and uh, what fraction of the baryons are in the hot halo or what fraction of the baryons are in the halos versus the intergalactic medium? If that topic interests you, I encourage you to reach out to KG, who may be on the line despite it being almost 3 a.m. in Japan. Let me pause there. Cosmic web analysis, the last two slides. Can you provide more details about how you combine the cosmic web observations with the FRBs to get these constraints? Yeah, I think this cartoon helps me better at least. Well, I can speak this one better so I know it better. Um, so for this field, as I said, um, the FRB from ASCAP happened to go off in a part of the Sloan footprint, section in the edge, but still had a fair number of galaxies. Uh, their distribution on the sky plus redshift, um, plus halo, plus mass, estimated from stellar mass estimates, uh, enables a reconstruction of the cosmic web. We use the slime mold, AG, and foam flams can use METIN's approach, which you're probably familiar with, um, to make an estimate of the cosmic web contribution parameterized by the things you saw in the, left, in the next figure, next slide. And then it's also valuable 
maybe not required, but valuable to include whatever knowledge we can generate or derive about galaxies close to the sight line, because uh, while there's only a handful predicted, expected, um, they can contribute substantially. So uh, that's part of the models is you know, how many halos, how many galaxies are close to the sight line. And based on their, <clears throat> uh, based on the observed magnitudes, convert that to a stellar mass, convert that to a stellar halo, sorry, halo mass. Substantial uncertainties along the way there um, to be included in the modeling. That helped Joe, should I? Yeah, I guess I was more just, is there actually, given the <clears throat> contribution from the FRB host and yeah. then our galaxy, like, I guess, how, how sensitive actually is it? That's what I was just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know they're marginalizing it's, it's, over that, but here there's, it's part of the, the model. Host. I'm, I'm actually here, sorry. Go, go, um, KG. That's, that's a toy model where all FRBs have the same host DM. And what breaks the degeneracy is that you have a host DM that has one plus Z that's, that's divided, that, that in the contribution of the DM has like a one plus Z FRB in it. So if you have samples of uh, spreading a wide range of redshifts, um, the DM contribution will change um, as a function of redshift if you are, if you are, um, um, if, if, if the host DM is the same. So that's what breaks the degeneracy. Um, but of course, um, if you assume that the host DM um, is embedded in the, is from the host galaxy itself, then of course the problem just boils down to modeling the halo contribution of the host galaxy. Great, thanks, Scott. And let me also, let me add the first at one point, which is an optimism or whatever, the, the blessing of FRBs, the fact that they're or the curse, that we're sensitive to all components. Um, the good news is we can actually attack them somewhat independently. So the technique, I didn't go into depth on it, or the Milky Way uh, dispersion measure, um, that can be assessed independently of some, to a large extent, uh, anything that's described in this slide. And so the community is going to be refining the Milky Way estimate. It will find ways to refine the host estimate. It will find ways to hopefully improve um, cosmic web estimates somewhat independently, whether that can all be thrown then at, at the end of the day into some huge MCMC, I don't know, but pro probably instead we'll just use them as priors. Um, that would just improve over time. Well, the answer is yes, because each FRB is an independent likelihood. Mm -hmm. So you can literally just run them one by one and combine the likelihoods at the end. But I'm saying, KG, that if people are, and they should be, concerned about the Milky Way contribution to this analysis, uh, I'm asserting that Chime, which is not going to be, because there's no redshift information in most of Chime's FRBs, nevertheless, that survey is going to place constraints on the Milky Way dispersion measure that can be used as a prior into this model. Yeah, but, but I think the crucial thing is that each FRB is an independent sideline. So you can you like you can tweak the assumptions in every single FRB that you analyze. Other questions on this?